Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya In this fifth canto there is a particular verse spoken by Sri Prahlad Maharaj. The chapter is entitled The Residence of Jambudweep, Offer Prayers, and this is a prayer by Sri Prahlad to Lord Nishringadev. This is a beautiful, very. So I ask all the devotees to chant responsibly. <coughs> Om Namo Bhagavate Narasimhaya. Namas Tejitaja say Avir Avir Bhava Rajanaka Rajadamstra Kamasayan Radaya Radaya Tamo Grasa Grasa Om Swaha Abayam Abayam Atmani Bhuyasta Om Shram Okay, let's all do it together. Om Namo Bhagavate Narasimhaya Namasteja Tejase Aviravir Bhava Rajanaka Rajadamstra Kamasayan Radaya Radaya Tamo Grasa Grasa Om Swaha Abhayam Abhayam Atmani Bhuyasta Om Shram Word for word Om O Lord Namaha My respectful obeisances Bhagavati Unto the Supreme Personality of Godhead Narasimhaya, known as Lord Nisrimha. Namaha, obeisances. Teja Teja say, the power of all power. Avir Avir Bhava, please be fully manifest. Vrajanaka, O you who possess nails like thunderbolts, 
Raja Damstra. O you who possesses teeth like thunderbolts. Kama Asayan. Demoniac desires to be happy by material activities. Radaya Radaya. Kindly vanquish. Tamaha. Ignorance in the material world. Grasa. Kindly drive away. Grasa. Kindly drive away. Om. Oh my Lord. Swaha. Respectful oblations. Abayam. Fearlessness. Abayam. Fearlessness. Atmani. In my mind. Buyasta. May you appear. Om. O oh Lord. Sham. The beach or seed of mantra, offering prayers to Lord Nisrinhade, Lord Nisimha. Okay, beautiful. And this is a beautiful prayer by Prahlad Maharaj. I offer my respectful obeisances unto Lord Nisimhade, the source of all power. O oh my Lord, who possesses nails and teeth just like thunderbolts, Kindly vanquish our demon-like desires for fruit of activity in this material world. Please appear in our hearts and drive away our ignorance so that by your mercy we may become fearless in the struggle for existence in this material world. Srila Prabhupada's lengthy purport. It is, no, not so lengthy, okay. Yat para panka japala sivila sabaktya karma sayan grahitam ugagrata yanti shantaham tarvanda rikta matayo yatayo pirudaha so trom ganastam maranam bhajavasudevam. Devotees always engage in the service of the toes of the Lord's lotus feet and very easily become free from the hard-knotted desires for material activities. So here is a very important point being made here. Material activities take their position within the heart or within the core of one's existence. The heart is being described as the core or the essence of our uh, existence. Now, when they take root, and one continues to feed those material desires, it's like tying in a knot. And then as the knot continues to be tied by the continuous feeding of material desires, the knot gets harder and harder and harder. And no one can come and untie the knot. It's not possible. The only way you can do that, get rid of that knot, you have to take a sharp knife or a sharp instrument and cut it. <laughs> Otherwise, that knot remains very, very strong. So this analogy is very appropriate because we all experience and we also see how when people get attached to something in this material world, nothing can change them. <laughs> they become so determined to fulfill their desires. Even though many times they fail, they still increase their determination to fulfill material desires. So, Desires are the root essence of the living entity's being. Without desire, there's no life. Life really means desire. You cannot be free from desires. Sometimes they speak about desirelessness. But when it's used in the Shastras, it means no material desire. Because life means desire. Only something that is not living cannot have desire. But everything that's living has desire. You see, even a little ant crawling around the ground, if you stick your finger in front of the ant, he goes the other way. He tries to avoid you. He has a desire, and his desire moves him like that. And this is true for all living beings. So these desires, once they are situated in the heart and continually reinforced, 
then they become like a very, very hard nut. <clears throat> and Prabhupada goes on. Because this is very difficult, the non-devotees, the jnanis and the yogis, cannot stop the waves of sense gratification, although they try to do so. So even though they want to get rid of these material desires, they can't. Here's an example of someone who would like to be free from, but because of their lifestyle, jnanis and yogis, their, their material desires remain. Therefore, Prahlad Maharaj says, you are advised to engage in devotional service to Krishna, the son of Vasudeva. Every living being within the material world has a strong desire to enjoy matter to the fullest satisfaction. For this purpose, the conditioned soul must accept one body after another. And thus, his strong, strongly fixed fruit of desires continues. One cannot stop the repetition of birth and death without being completely desireless. So the word desireless here means no material desire. Therefore, Srila Rupa Goswami describes pure bhakti as ayabila sita sunyam, jnana karmana navritam, anukulena krishna, silanam bhaktam uttama. <clears throat> One should render devotional service. One should render transcendental loving service to the Supreme Lord Krishna favorably and without a desire for material profit or gain through fruit of activities or philosophical speculation. So when sometimes when people ask us, well, what is, what, how do you describe pure devotional service? This verse is the complete description and there's nothing more than that. So if you know this verse and the meaning of this verse, you can explain what is pure devotional service and what it means here, and it'll go on. Unless one is completely freed from all material desires which are caused by the dense darkness of ignorance. So here, material desires are not giving any, 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 uh, what's the word? Any credit at all. They're compared to darkness. And not only darkness, but that darkness that is intense. <clears throat> Have you ever been in a place where there is no source of light at all? It's completely dark and there's no light anywhere around. It becomes, they call it, they call it pitch black. Sometimes they use that terminology. So here Prabhupada says the denseness of darkness. When darkness becomes so thick that it's, you, <clears throat> you, you, you feel like there's nothing else but darkness, that's all there is. And then here it's explained that material desires are like dense darkness. And one cannot engage in devotional service as long as these, devotional, these material desires are there. So what does that mean? We're engaging in devotional service, we may still have material desires, but it says you can't. So is that a contradiction? Therefore, we should always offer our prayers to Lord Nisringhadev, who killed Harani Kashipu, the personification of material desires. And then Prabhupada describes what is that personification. Haranya means gold, wealth. Kashipu means a soft cushion or bed, material comfort. Materialistic persons always die, desire to make the body comfortable and for this they require huge amounts of gold. Thus, Harani Kashipu was the perfect representative of materialistic life. He was there for the cause of disturbance to the topmost devotee, Prahlad Maharaj, until Lord Nasimhadev killed him. Any devotee, here's the, here's, the, here's the key, any devotee aspiring to be free from material desire should offer this, his respectful prayers to Nusringadev as Prahlad Maharaj did in this verse. In other words, we should use this prayer to offer our also desire to become free from material desires by repeating this prayer by Prahlad Maharaj. Om Ajnan Timirandasya Giranjana Salakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha 
Sri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Staptitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadam Ayam Dadati Swampadati Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gaudavani Prachadine Nirvasesa Sunyavadi Pastyatya De Satarine Panchakalpa, Thiruvishya, Kriva, Sindhu, Pehebacha, Patitanam, Bhavane, Bhyo, Vaishnave, Bhyo, Namaho, Namaha, Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu, Nityananda, Sri Advaita, Gadadhar, Sivasiddhi, Gaur, Bhakta, Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So it is mentioned by Srila Bhakti Vinota Kaur that we approach Lord Nisringadev for some benediction. Uh, and Bhakti Vinota Kaur, he actually makes a point, and actually, he's actually repeating Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, who says, wherever there is a prayer, there's a request for a benediction. So no prayer is free from personal request. And we may be material prayers, there may be mixed material spiritual prayers, or there may be pure spiritual prayers. But anyone and everyone who prays, there's something that they're requesting. And here, Prahlad Maharaj is also requesting. He's saying, appear in our hearts, my dear Lord. Because the heart is the seat of emotion, which is the seat of desire. And then he's using that in the, as an example. And although the Lord is in our heart, he can't be any other place in terms of our relationship with him. He is situated in the heart, but now he's asking the Lord, appear in your, my heart. Why? Because I actually want you to do some service. <laughs> he's asking the Lord for to do something. He says, remove these material desires from my heart, which are like demons. Uh, you have Rajanaka, Rajadamstra. You have powerful teeth, powerful nails, killed Rani Kasipu with his nails. And just by, you know, just like a little, like a little, like a child might take an insect and just squeeze it. It was that easy. But these powerful nails to, you know, to Harani Kashipu were death personified. But the Lord wanted, I mean, Prahlad Maharaj wanted that now please do this to me also. <laughs> but not, not in the same way. <laughs> but get rid of those Harani Kashipus that are running around in my heart. Because <laughs> this is really what he's saying. So the personification that's mentioned here by Srila Prabhupada of material desire is those who are like Hirani Kashipus. So we have so many Hirani Kashipus in this world. Some are big eyes and some are in between. Some are small. But everyone's an Hirani Kashipu because they have desires to enjoy this material world. And if that is there within the heart, then one cannot fulfill one's desire for real and eternal happiness. Happiness does not manifest as long as that Harani Kasipu is there. Prahlad Maharaj, he was fearless, but now he's also praying for fearlessness. He says, because you are present, because you can destroy these desires that we have to enjoy this world, then what will be what will be the result? We'll be fearless. We'll be fearless. Now, Srila Prabhupada makes this point very clearly in many of his lectures that fearless fearlessness is not generally attained by anyone in this world. Everyone, he says, everyone in this world has some element of fear. Fear of not getting, fear of losing, fear of not enjoying once when we receive something. We get something and still doesn't make us happy. There's a fear that comes with, oh, I achieved it, but I didn't achieve my goal. So fear is there. This material world is called bayam, 
Bayam Loka, it's a place of fear. And Shakespeare gave the ultimate principle, what is the greatest of all fear? He said, there's the rub, <laughs> death. Everyone is afraid of death, everyone, to some degree. Only when one is situated purely on the tra transcendental platform engaged in devotional service can they attain the, the complete element of fearlessness. But we can develop fearlessness up to a very high level where we simply depend on Krishna for everything. This is like this situation in the world today. It's all being propagated by fear. People, I, I was told people are dying out of fear because of what's going on in the world today. Not because of anything else. They're so fearful that it's causing, because fear is a mental disease and it can take root in the physical form and then you get sick and then people die. But devotee is abhayam. Abhayam means fearless because they know Lord Nishringadev is there. Krishna is there. All I have to do is take shelter of Krishna and there's no fear. But we're not convinced because we still try to make our own arrangements to somehow or other stay happy in this material world, <laughs> whatever happiness we have somehow supplied for our life. In other words, we have our program for happiness. But as long as we try to enjoy in this world, we'll be fearful. There's no way you can get around that. As long as you're trying to enjoy, there is that element of fear. So as you decrease that d desire to enjoy, you also decrease your element of fear, fearfulness. And then you can come to the point of simply depending on Krishna and knowing that he is always there for his devotee. So devotees are fearless. Why? Because they are connected with the all-powerful source of all existence. Prabhupada gave a nice definition of fear. He said fear means two. Two. One, two. The number two. So what does that mean? Well, it means that, is there anything outside of Krishna? No. Krishna is everything. But it looks like there's something else. And because we, it looks like there's something else, there's the fear element. But when you know there's only Krishna, and nothing happens without Krishna's sanction, then you know that, that fearlessness, fearfulness, simply trying to see something that doesn't exist. <laughs> so in other words, what devotees know, that there's only Krishna and Krishna's energy, and Krishna's energy is controlled by Krishna. <laughs> you know, he would, he would, what was that verse? Maya Dakshena Prakriti? Suyate sacharacharam hetu nanai nikonteya chigalvi parvi partante. That this whole material energy is working completely, perfectly under the control of the Supreme Lord and is being done through his agency called, you know, the material energy. But he is the all absolute principle. So, therefore, when you know that, there's nothing you know that everything, anything that's happening, has some element of Krishna in it. <laughs> and Krishna is also Maya in one sense because he puts the material energy in force. He empowers it by certain characteristics and, qual and quality and it moves under his direction. So, but a devotee is not like, well, I'm fearless, I'll just go walking out in front of the car. <laughs> because I'm fearless, but that's foolishness, that's stupid. Or doing something you shouldn't be doing and expecting to get protected. In other words, you have to follow the etiquette of life and live according to, you take care and you act properly, accordingly, and then you can know that Krishna is always there. If you act outside of Krishna's desire for you, you may still be protected, but you may get a little kick. <laughs> and if you act too far out, you may somehow get smashed. Because we have to learn how to live in this world, and there's a way to learn how to live. And protection is, a, uh, is an innate quality of the living entity. Everyone wants protection. 
But you can't protect yourself completely or even partially. You have to go to where that source of power is. And as it says here, the one translation, Teja Teja say, the power of all powers. So whatever is powerful in this world is being conducted by the all-powerful one, Sri Krishna. When Prahlad Maharaj was being harassed by his father, Harani Kashipu, and trying to be killed in so many ways, it's, nothing could, I mean, there was not even a tiny little inconvenience in Prahlad Maharaj's undergoing the tortures that his father was trying to give him. Not even a hair on his body was disturbed. That's how much Lord Nishringadev protected him. And his father, I mean, he's a powerful demon. He knows what power is. And he has power over all the demigods, practically, except Brahma, Shiva, and Narada Muni. He's the only three demigods he couldn't control. And uh, he said, where do you get your power from? <laughs> and Prahlad said, well, my dear father, I get my power from the same place you get your power from. <laughs> the same place everybody gets theirs, but there's only one source. <laughs> and Akhandi Kashipu didn't want to hear that. He said, my power is my power. <laughs> but that's a fact. The Lord is even empowering the demons to become demons. Why? Because that's what they want. <laughs> if you want to become a demon, you can do it, and Krishna will help you. <laughs> but he'll first he'll show you what a fool you are for trying. <laughs> and then after you decide to do it anyway, he says, all right, good luck. <laughs> and then he empowers you to be, fulfill your desires like that. Yeah, there's a nice, nice verse in the seventh canto in the First chapter, verse number eight. Do we have the seventh canto? Mm -hmm. Or someone can maybe pull it up on their phone. Seven one eight. It's just, it just shows you how neutral Krishna is. Just like now, people might be thinking, well, why doesn't Krishna come in here and stop this virus and all this crazy stuff going on? But then again, he's neutral. 718. It's a beautiful verse. I mean, and Jiva Goswami gives a commentary on the verse also in his Sindarbha. Yeah. It says, this is an interesting verse. When the quality of goodness is prominent, the sages and the demigods flourish with the help of that quality. Which, with which where they are infused and surcharged by the Supreme Lord. Similarly, similarly, when the mode of passion is prominent, the demons flourish, and when ignorance is prominent, the yakshas and rakshashas flourish. The Supreme Personality of Godhead is present in everyone's heart, fostering the reactions of sattva-guna, rajaguna, and tamaguna. So he's giving the results. The demons are, now the demons are pretty much prominent in the world. Why? Because people are sinful, and sinful activities attract more and more people to come from different planetary systems, and these are demons. And so the demons get in control, and what happens? Everything goes haywire, and they harass everybody, and, and then they cause havoc in the world. And, but what does Krishna do? He'll protect the devotees from the demons. The, devo the, devo the demons can't touch the devotees. But at the same time, those who don't take shelter, they're victimized by the demons. And it goes on. The mode of passion gets stronger and stronger and stronger. More the demons increase. Prabhupada said, in Kali Yuga, the demons are becoming more and more and more as, the, as this age goes on. And then, even in mode of ignorance, you have those persons who are even more ferocious than demons, the rakshashas and the yakshas. They're man-eaters. They're just like cannibals <laughs> with mystic power. Many of them have mystic power also. So, whatever mode is prominent, and what causes the mode to be prominent? People's activities. So when people are sinful, 
and they live a sinful life, that mode becomes strong. That's why it says that the mode of goodness is practically inconspicuous by its presence, by its absence. The mode of goodness is hardly here at all in this age, only you can find it in devotional circles and in a, maybe a few other small places. But passion and ignorance is strong. It's very strong. You can feel it. It's a heavy energy. The more, the more sinful the energy is, the more heavy the atmosphere becomes with that energy. And so, Prahlad Maharaj knows how dangerous this material world is. But he's a pure devotee. He's taken shelter of the Lord. But he's praying for us. This is the important part in this verse. He wants us to understand how we can save ourselves by taking shelter of the Sringadev and praying in the same way. Kill those the demon desires and make us fear fearless in our struggle to live in this world. To live in this world is a struggle because to get a material body is unnatural. It's not natural to have a material body. The soul, by nature, doesn't need a material body. But when, when the soul comes to this level of existence, it can only function with a material body, and that is due to the soul's desire to enjoy something different than Krishna. In other words, to look outside of Krishna for something. And then the material body gets. So to have a material body means to struggle. Everyone, even the greatest and most, you may might say, successful people in the world who have all material opulence, they're still struggling. They struggle. In fact, sometimes they even struggle more than people who have less. <laughs> uh, they have their bodies, they struggle with health, they struggle mostly. It says that for a non-devotee, his mind is a burden. And for a devotee, his body is a burden. <laughs> Devotees, got, their, their minds are nice, you know. Kind of, kind of like everybody, and everybody likes us. <laughs> At least, mostly, anyway. <laughs> and devotees are happy, they chant Hare Krishna, and if they can't get happiness from chanting Hare Krishna, they eat nice and pra, some nice prasadam. <laughs> and then they still become happy. So happiness is not so hard in Krishna consciousness. It's quite available everywhere, and devotees are generally happy. But again, we have to drag this body around. Uh, <laughs> it's like drag, you know, you know. It's like trying to pull a dead weight, you know, with a with a rope. It's so, you know. But the demon, the other, the materialists, they are for, They're out there running. And they're getting all their steroids and getting their muscles built up, and they're getting, you know, they, they read all kinds of books on how to become healthy, and then they work out in gyms, and they do all kinds, and, you know, they, they get that, but their minds are a mess. <laughs> they're always disturbed. But they put so much emphasis on the body like that. And so it's the opposite. So devotees have to struggle in this material world with our dragging his body around, <laughs> keeping it comfortable as much as we can, <laughs> keeping it fed, <laughs> keeping it whatever else it needs. <laughs> you know? And then sometimes everybody wants to use your body for their own selfish interest, then you have a problem. <laughs> it's my body, but everybody else wants to, to use it. <laughs> so it's, you know, the, dog, the boss says, well, uh, you know, we got the deadline, and I know you have to go home to your wife, but can you stay another two hours? <laughs> can you work overtime? You know, I'll double your salary, maybe triple for the overtime, or, you know, something. And there's always somebody giving you some, some proposal to increase your body for their benefit. <laughs> So you know, your body doesn't even belong to you. It usually belongs to everybody else who's using it. And that's in the Shastras also. Prabhupada talks about that. How your body belongs to mother and father because they gave it to you. And it belongs to the society because they, they want you to use it in different ways. It belongs to your employer who works it. 
it belongs to the grocery store because he feeds it. You know? <laughs> it belongs to everybody except yourself. <laughs> and then when you die, where does it go? It belongs to the the insects or the the, the earth <laughs> or something. <laughs> and the body is just a body. It's a burden. There's no question about it. And as you get older, when you're young, it's you know not so bad. <laughs> When you get older, and then, huh? What did you say? Can you repeat that? <laughs> Wait, let me turn up the the volume here. Oh, okay, now say again. <laughs> well, wait a minute. I have the other one. It's not working as good. <laughs> and then you have you have you can't. And then I can't see you. Where are you? Oh, there you. Oh, oh where's the glasses? Oh, I left my glass. Oh, I, somebody stole my glasses. I can't see. <laughs> So you have, you can't you have you have four eyes and you have you have to have and then you have to have three legs you walk with a cane you know <laughs> so everything breaks down you go to bed at night and you can't get up in the morning because everything hurts <laughs> it's like <laughs> so that's old age I'm just for those of you who haven't heard of, you've heard about it I know it's in the scriptures it's it's much worse than what it says it is. <laughs> So this is this is this is life in the material world, <laughs> and so Prahlad Maharaj is saying we have to struggle in this world, and but if we have fear, how can we overcome? How can we win in our struggle? Therefore, make us fearless. He's praying for fearless. So when we worship the Lord in His form as the protective agency, He's giving fearlessness and He's also giving personal protection. The Lord is always personally there to protect his devotees. Okay, we got it. And then there's one other thing that the Lord does, and that he destroys material illusions. This is the third principle. As Mo mentioned by Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur, material life is presents presents itself as some form of enjoyment. You see something, or you have a desire to attain something, your mind creates that this will give you happiness. But then again, when you have the knowledge to know that material things cannot bring happiness, they can bring some temporary relief from suffering, but they can't bring happiness. When you know that, how is that not known by the Lord giving that knowledge, either through Shastra, in the heart, or reminding you, oh, you're looking at that for enjoyment, there's no enjoyment there, it's simply an illusion. So that's, that's what the Sringadev does, that's the third thing, it's not mentioned here, but it's actually a part of the second, the first one, he destroys material illusions. We think, you know, oh, this look at that beautiful girl over there, boy. And then a person might think, oh, I'm going to enjoy that. And then it's somebody else's wife. <laughs> but then they think, oh, that's dangerous. But still, it looks nice. <laughs> Maybe, you know, you know it's, it happens all the time. <laughs> it's happening even in ISKCON, I can tell you that for sure. <laughs> I had, there was one... One man, he, I saw it twice in Iskand, somebody stole somebody's wife, right underneath, you know, he was like, hey, the, the, the husband was still there, <laughs> he stole his wife, the husband was going to kill him, I stopped him from killing him, <laughs> I, I, was a, I did a good deed that day, he had a brick and he was waiting for him to come and he was going to smash him with the brick. And I told him, you know, it's just not the way to do it. This is, you know, you're just going to make it, make life terrible. And then another devotee, he uh, it happened to another devotee earlier, and uh, he was also he got a gun. He was out. He was ready to kill the guy. So, but people can they know this is another person's wife, and still they could get killed. That's that's the how powerful material illusions can be, thinking that I can be happy here, forgetting. It's just the same as we preach to people who 
been in jail or in jail, and then when they get out, they still have that tendency to commit crimes, knowing that they could get back in jail again or even be killed. You know, you can go and try to steal something from somebody's house and get killed mm -hmm. by doing it. Still, th this is to show you, I mean, we all know these things, I'm just reminding you, how powerful material desires are. They're very, very powerful. They completely block out all intelligence. Dayate vishayam pumsam teshu sangat sajayate sangat sajayate kama kama krodha bijayate krodha bhavati samoham samoham shriti ri brahma shriti brahmsa budinasa budinasa panashyati by contemplating material objects for sense gratification, lust develops. From lust comes anger. From anger, bewilderment. From anger, delusion. From delusion, bewilderment of memory. When memory is lost, when memory is bewildered, intelligence is, is lost. When intelligence is lost, one falls again into the material world. Vrnashiti falls down. So, simply by contemplating material desires, we start getting an emotional feeling for that. And then when it comes strong, the feeling comes strong, and then we try to act on it in one particular way. So, but when we contemplate the lotus feet of the Lord in devotion, or contemplate our, our activities in devotional service, we're awakening the spiritual element, in other words, our bhakti. And that kind of contemplation is recommended because this brings you higher consciousness or the Krishna consciousness. So, and therefore, the Lord is so kind that not only does he provide himself as the object for our service, but he also helps us to get rid of those things which are blocking the path of devotional service. And especially, Lord Nishringadev is empowered to do that service. He's very kind to devotees. He has a, a way of making himself present in the life of devotees in such a way that he serves the devotees when they actually seriously take shelter. Yeah, they take shelter of him. And he gives protection. He gives, he gets, helps you to uproot material desires, and he helps you to see the illusions of material life like that. So that's, that's the Sringadev. So this prayer is very, very powerful. That's why Prabhupada ended the, his purport by saying, any devotee aspiring to be free from material desire should offer his respectful prayers to Nusimhadev as Prahlad Maharaj did in this verse. Mm -hmm. So it's a highly recommended prayer like that. It's a beautiful prayer. It has a lot of powerful words in it. And when it's chanted, it's, it's, like, it's, it's like a pure mantra. It's, only, it's actually a mantra. It's more than just a prayer. So we are fortunate to have the opportunity to glorify Lord Nishringadev. So on this particular day, we can make a vow or make an offering to Lord Nisringadev to somehow or other take shelter of him more, pray to him more, ask for his mercy in the form of getting rid of material desires. And that way we can move forward on the path of devotional service. Sometimes we see devotees, they get stuck They've been practicing Krishna consciousness for sometimes 20 years, and they're not moving anywhere. Why? Material attachments are there. Because of those material attachments, they can't move forward. They're chanting Hare Krishna. They may even be reading the books. But because they're still keeping those material attachments, it's like so slow. So slow. And then sometimes, because of no actual progress, they give it up and go back to material. They think, oh, it's 
this Krishna consciousness doesn't work, I'm doing everything. The reason is we're still hanging on to material desires. That's the only reason. Or if we're committing offenses, that will also block us which is another form of material desire. But material desires are like roadblocks, <laughs> depending on the nature of that material desire. So therefore, this prayer has great, great efficacy in helping us understand how to move forward. Because as you move forward in devotional service, you become happy, you become peaceful, you become well, you develop knowledge, and you develop a, a, an attraction for everyone. You have a natural affinity for everyone. And that affinity takes a different form by trying to serve people who you come in contact with. You see that those devotees who are fixed in Krishna consciousness, they're always trying to serve, that's all. And the more they can serve, the more they're happy because they, that, happy, that happiness that comes from service is an indication of the, of the elevation or the, the growth of their own bhakti. The more you develop your bhakti, the more you want to serve Krishna, you want to serve others, and you want to be an instrument for bringing Krishna consciousness into the lives of others. It becomes natural, because bhakti includes Krishna and everything included with Krishna. That means all living entities like that. So when one, just like Prahlad Maharaj, when he was asked by Nisringadev to take a benediction, the Lord wanted to somehow reciprocate Prahlad Maharaj's love. He wanted to show him in some way, uh, you worship me so nicely, you have so much affection and love for me. I want to offer you something. The Lord doesn't think, well, he's my devotee and he's getting me, that's enough. No, the Lord wants to do something. He actually wants to give you some benediction. And so he's asking, not only asking, Prahlad Maharaj actually says, my dear Lord, you know, I'm not a vinik. I'm not a merchant. I don't worship you <laughs> in order to receive something. I, because I love you, I'm happy just serving you, that's all. <laughs> but the Lord didn't want to hear that. <laughs> I mean, he heard it, but he wanted to say, well, that's nice, but still, take some benediction. <laughs> and finally, after he forced him, he said, all right, can you liberate my father? <laughs> you know, that guy you killed a little while ago. <laughs> and then the Lord said, as soon as I put my nail, he didn't say it in this way, but as soon as I touched him, he was, he was liberated. <laughs> so the Lord had already done that. So then he said, the Lord came back and said, what else? Can you ask for something else? <laughs> and Prahlad didn't know what to say. Finally, he thought the Lord must have appeared in his mind in some way. And he said, my dear Lord, if you really want to give me a benediction, then let me stay in this material world and preach to these non-devotees who are making a humbug civilization. <laughs> now, in other words, let me be an instrument for your mercy for others. When the Lord heard that, he just, he, he, he just, his heart was melted by the love of his devotee. He only wanted to serve the Lord by serving others to help them become Krishna conscious. That's Prahlad Maharaj. Prahlad Maharaj, when Prabhupada used to think of, sometimes Prabhupada, when he would speak about Prahlad Maharaj, he would become silent for a few minutes. And you know, he would be in deep meditation thinking of the love of Prahlad Maharaj. Just a five-year-old boy. He was completely in love with Krishna and he had no fear. And, Prala, and pra, Prabhupada, when he would speak on Bhagavatam, he would always mention Prahlad Maharaj in some way, refer to him in different ways. And when he would speak about sections of Bhagavatam, he took the seventh canto, and he spoke about that the most. In that pastime, he spoke at least three different occasions. And during his last months with us, 
In 1977, he was speaking only on Prahlad Maharaj. <laughs> so we understand how great Prahlad Maharaj was. You can see how he's praying here. The next verse even shows his, his greatness even more so. This next verse is, shows how much love he had for every living entity. And that was Prahlad Maharaj. And that same Prahlad Maharaj, that spirit of Prahlad Maharaj entered into the body of Srila Haridas Thakur, who was also a manifestation of compassion for the fallen conditioned souls. Not only chanting the holy name so many rounds, but at the same time preaching Krishna consciousness to others. So that same spirit was there within the body of Haridas Thakur. So I'll read the next verse just so you get a little deeper understanding of how Prahlad Maharaj is praying. It's a beautiful verse. Svavastu vishvas kalair pasiditam dayantu bhuvanti shiyam mito diya manaschivadram bhajate rahok sajay aveshyatam no matir apya hai tuki. He says, may there be good fortune throughout the universe. And may all envious persons be pacified. May all living entities become calm by practicing bhakti yoga. For by accepting devotional service, they will think of each other's welfare. Therefore, let us engage in the service of the Supreme Transcendence, Lord Sri Krishna, and always remain absorbed in thoughts of Him. So here, the Prahlad Maharaj is praying that people are envious. So let, let's pray that they, they get over their envious and become calm and peaceful. And let them accept devotional service. And when they do, they'll think of the welfare of each other. And then when, when people think of each other's welfare, there's no problems in the world. There's no problems in the world. Problems come when we put ourselves in the center and then we center everything around that. And everyone wants to be the center, so how many centers can there be? <laughs> so you, Prabhupada would talk about using the example, you, maybe when you were a kid, you go down to a river and you throw a rock in the water, and then it makes a circle, and if you keep throwing the rock in the same place, the circles become concentric, and they don't clash. But if you throw rocks in, in different places, then the circles are clashing with each other, like that. So when we keep Krishna in the center, keep devotional service to Krishna and to his devotees in the center, then there's no clash. There's no, there's no problems. Everyone is thinking for the benefit of each other. And that's what Prahlad Maharaj prays in this next verse. This is a beautiful, beautiful verse. And it's a very long purport too. So this, sometimes we say this verse is the peace verse in the Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we'll also have an opportunity to, again, discuss the pastimes of Lord Nishringadev this evening for the festival. So we'll stop here and see, yes sir, what is your name? Hmm? Nyaguna, Hare Krishna. Uh, you were saying that the body is a burden for the body. So I have any doubts about it. Like, uh, we know that there is a saying of healthy mind and a healthy body, and also we know that the body, the material elements, are Krishna's energy. And that uh, Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, I am Tarashi, you just can see, Tajusi, the best, yeah, Krishna. Whatever we do with the body, we can do it for Krishna. Mm -hmm. Krishna is called Govinda, that he gives pleasure to the senses and to the plant, I think the plant or for the cow. So then, then the body for the body is not a burden in this way because you just do everything for Krishna, then you feel a lot of. You can make us the pleasure by. Not the body, that is my doubt. If you do it for Krishna, so there is no problem. Yeah. Mm, that's true to a certain degree. <laughs> that's there. 
But you still have to undergo difficulties when you have a material body. It's just the way it is. <laughs> Prabhupada makes the example. He said, to have a material body is a bad bargain. <laughs> and then, using your explanation, but he said, if you use it in devotional service, that's called the best use of a bad bargain. <laughs> the best use of a bad because there, there is a verse spoken by Rishabdev. It's in this fifth canto also. And it says, let's see, let me see, where's that verse? And it's in the fifth chapter of this same, I think it's verse number 552, five, I think it is. It says here, Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, those who are interested in reviving Krishna consciousness and increasing their love for Godhead do not like to do anything that is not related to Krishna. They are not interested in mingling with people who are busy maintaining their bodies, eating, sleeping, mating, and defending. They are not attached to their homes, although they may be householders. They're not attached to their wives, children, friends, and wealth. At the same time, they are not indifferent to the execution of the devotionals of their duties. Such persons are interested in collecting only enough money to keep the body and soul together. Hmm. Where is that? I think maybe it's the. Well, anyway, I I completely agree with what you said. <laughs> There's no question about that. But still, you got to drag this body around. <laughs> it's, it's just the way it is. <laughs> You got to feed it. You got to make sure it's rested. You got to do so many things to keep it. You got to keep it clean, keep it healthy. It's it's a full. It's almost a full time job in many cases, just keeping it. And you know, Krishna helps, as you mentioned, when you use it in devotion. Yet karosi aranasi. Well, it's, it, it depends how you're seeing it from different angles. When you realize that the soul has nothing to do with the body, ultimately, then you realize it's a burden. But then in this material world, if you have a human form of life, it's considered to be a benediction because you can use that human form to go back to Godhead. So in that sense, it becomes an asset as compared to other bodies like that. But from the absolute point of view, the soul doesn't need a body. <laughs> but as long as in its material world, we need a body. Some form of life. So in that sense, that's what I was using the, the term burden. It's, it's just unnatural to have a material body. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, you were speaking about um, how, um, we shouldn't be doing things we should. Uh, we should be doing the things we shouldn't be doing, and then expecting protection from, from the Lord. Well, there's there's a protocol how to live in this world, and, and we should know how to live. And protection is a natural, natural quality of the living into one. But if you act 
crazy or whimsical or just improper, you're putting yourself under an, that other energy. So you, there is a way to live. Everyone has a particular etiquette that they should follow in order to live. What's the, what's the question again? Uh, to what extent can we break laws? For example, during this COVID-19... Um, COVID-19? COVID-19? In other words, if you, if you want to preach and you're being restricted to preach and uh, the laws are making, should you look for ways around that to preach? Yeah. <laughs> I might get in trouble for that one. <laughs> Because spiritual is always more important. But Brahma Prabhupada says when you're, when you're dealing with cheaters, you have to cheat. <laughs> That's another statement. <laughs> so, but you're not doing it for yourself. That's the point. If you're acting for yourself, that's one thing. But if you're acting for Krishna and a higher purpose, that's different. But then you should also consider what are the alternatives and not just go ahead and do things. There may be some way you can get around it without causing difficulties. He explores the possibilities. Yeah, Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Well, Srila Haridas Thakur is mentioned that he is three persons in one. He's Lord Brahma. He is Rachika Muni. Or no, 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 I'm sorry. He is a, the son of Rachika Muni called Haridas. And he is also has the spirit of Prahlad Maharaj. That's mentioned when they describe in one section, I think. Uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur mentions that, that he's these two persons with the spirit of Prahlad also. So some people say Prahlad Maharaj also. Yeah, so that spirit of compassion, uh, that complete compassion, meditating on how to give Krishna consciousness to others. Prabhupada was like that. He was... When you were with Prabhupada, he was always thinking how to spread Krishna consciousness. And if you, were, if you weren't on that level, you would find it hard to associate with Prabhupada because he was intense. He didn't want to waste one moment not thinking in one way how to bring Krishna consciousness to, the, to, to people. And Prabhupada, you saw what Prabhupada did in 11 years. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge miracle, not just a small one. And we, but, you know, he had that spirit of Prahlad also, just wanting to give Krishna consciousness to others. And that's mentioned with Hari Das Thakur also. Mm. Anything else? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, Vrindavan Nath. Uh, my question is that Prahlad Maharaj is considered as one of the uh, most elevated soul, where he was having so much unflinching faith and surrender to uh, Lord. And uh, that was the reason that he was saved by Lord in every situation when his father tried to kill him. So when he asking in this first prayer to Lord that please try to remove this material uh, desires, is this just like out of humility or is this like for us? Is it like this is maybe for us? He's praying for us. 
He's teaching us how we should pray. But he's also, that element of humility is also there. Because we all, we understand from Shastra that a great devotee never thinks himself great, thinks himself very fallen. Just like it says, there is a, there's three kinds of devotees, first class, second class, and third class. So third class devotee, he likes the guru and he likes the deities, but he doesn't like anybody else. <laughs> he thinks the other devotees are just nuisance, they get in the way. <laughs> That's called neophyte. And then the second class devotee, there's four characteristics. They give their love to Krishna, they make friends with other devotees, they preach to the innocent and they avoid the atheist. That's second class. And that's the level we're meant to practice Krishna consciousness. That's called Madhyama Adhikari. And that's where our movement operates on that second class. First class you can't operate on, and that is, that is, they see everyone serving Krishna more than them, and they don't preach. They, don't even, they even see the non-devotees as being more advanced than they are. That's why when we say, Jayom Vishnupad Paramahansa Parivajakacharja, Astotara Sattva Sri Sriman, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, Paramahansa Pariva Jakacharya. Paramahansa is the highest platform. But for preaching, they come down to the second class platform, which is Pari, Pariva Jakacharya, traveling preacher. So therefore they have to make discriminations between devotees and non-devotees. But a, a Paramahansa doesn't. He sees that the non-devotees are serving Maya. Maya is a pure devotee. <laughs> so they're all devotees of a pure devotee, Maya. <laughs> he doesn't preach. Prabhupada said Radharani is like that. She's, Radharani sees everyone better than her. <laughs> and when Prabhupada was leaving the body towards the end, he went into a different mood towards the end. He started to apologize to everyone for speaking so strongly. And everyone was getting really nervous hearing Prabhupada's prayers. Even many, some of his god brothers were there. And he was saying, oh, I, I spoke so strongly. I, you know, I use strong language. Please forgive me all my offenses. <laughs> really? But there was no offense in what he was doing. He was preaching. And he was just explaining things as it was, but in his last days he went into a, more into his mood of, you know, Par Paramahansa. He was feeling remorse that somehow he committed offenses by preaching. But everyone was saying, no, no, Prabhupada, you could, <laughs> you know, you know, everything you did was perfect, it's okay. And Prabhupada said, no, no, I was, very, I was offensive. So please forgive me. Yeah, he was asking forgiveness. That was a very sweet and very rare moment, but it it happened. So yeah, a great devotee doesn't think themselves great at all. Mm. Hare Krishna. <laughs> Thank you. Srila Prabhupada Kijai.